Thank you, Mrs. Golfing, for that wonderful introduction and also for your support uh, for this initiative. The Eminent Family Wellbeing Challenge launched a few months ago with a workshop here in Las Vegas in uh, February. I mean, who'd have thought the world would have changed so much between now and then? Uh, you'll see behind me pictures of people that were at the workshop. Um, Mrs. Golfing was included, Mrs. Wilson, the wife of the Vice Chief as well, as well as some pretty amazing airmen, spouses, and other subject matter experts from academia and industry. In fact, most of my panel I met in person um, at that workshop. So our topic for this panel is holistic well-being. It's time to look at the whole person. And this is definitely something very close to my heart. I have some pretty amazing panelists with me. Um, you can see their bios um, on our website, but we have uh, Candice Hatcher-Solis, a neuroscientist at AFRL. We have uh, Mary Palenko, senior enlisted advisor for the Air Force Resilience Program. Maggie Laws, human resilience program manager for the Air Force. And Tara Falcon, founder of Rise Up. So welcome, ladies. So I'd love to post the first question, Mary, to you. Uh, given the current environment that we're in, I'd, uh, I'd love to know how the conversation around resiliency and well-being of our airmen and their families has changed given the current environment. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, well, first, thank you for having us on the panel. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joining. Uh, when COVID hit, um, there was a massive shift in conversation as far as what we can do right here and now to assist with uh, all the challenges that a lot of us have never uh, even thought of. And so um, the COVID, we have pushed out lots and lots of information uh, for things like homeschooling, which I know as an active duty service member for 20 plus years, that was never even on my radar, uh, but things like that, as well as um, isolation. And I think that the talk surrounding resilience has shifted not from the foundation of what resilience means and how it's important for us, but just some of the unique challenges that we are facing. And I also think it was a great opportunity for us to really adopt grace for everyone. Um, I know that my challenges I'm experiencing, I have two little ones who I am homeschooling, are different than the airmen who may be isolated or may be working in the med group 12 hours a day. Um, so it's just really allowed us to all kind of listen to each other a little bit more um, and talk about resilience in a different way as it relates to us today. Yeah, I can certainly attest to my family. I have two teenage kids um, and a wife that works at home and I'm working at home. So it's definitely, it's definitely changed my family life as well. So Maggie, next question for you. Um, mm -hmm. Given there's, you know, over 700,000 people that work within the Air Force um, and all of its different contractors. What have you found so far that's the best ways to connect, actually make a, you know, a real connection um, with airmen? And then if you wouldn't mind adding to that, how do you connect with the spouses uh, specifically? Because I'm assuming that would be very different. Well, thank you. Thank you again, too, for having us, um, just like Chief Polanco had stated. So one of the things we found is, I think there's a misnomer with the new generation that they want to be connected to via text or you know just through uh, written communications. But the truth is, they're a really engaging population and they really thrive on that face-to-face -face connection. And so what we found, especially with COVID, one of the best ways to do that is to continue that face-to-face -face using virtual platforms just like we are today. Um, and we're seeing that spring up right and left. Um, we see Zoom, we see WebEx, we see FaceTime. Um, there's a lot of things that they're doing and that's helping to keep them connected. Um, but more importantly, our leaders are really reaching out in these facets to not just um, ensure that they're in with all the workplace uh, things that need to go on, but they also are asking them questions about them to engage with them to make sure that they're okay um, and coping with, with what's going on with the COVID. To answer your second question, I'm really excited to share. So since COVID started, this really launched a huge virtual communication stream. And for spouses, particularly our senior leader spouses from the top down have been hosting virtual sessions. And that's really trickling all across the Air Force. 
we see an increase in spouse engagement with these virtual sessions that they're hosting via FaceTime, Zoom, those things, because we're actually eliminating some barriers that they might have had previously, like finding childcare, getting to an installation, um, being able to leave work. So those things are, are actually being um, taken care of by hosting these virtual sessions. And so we've seen an increase in those engagements with our spouse and co community. So we're really excited about that in response to what's happening. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Yeah, is there anything that, that we did, uh, you know, maybe before COVID hit that you found worked really well uh, for Emin and their spouses that you could be in mind sharing? Um, yeah, so before COVID hit, one of the biggest things that we found, and we're still trying to keep continuously reinforce it, honestly, is that face-to-face -face communication. So really having those meaningful, intentional conversations to make each and every airman feel like they're valued. Um, and that happens at the lowest levels all the way up. Um, and so when we see that happening, we recognize that the, the morale and the welfare of that particular unit or community is um, a little bit more thriving. And then the same with spouses, it's reaching out to them, understanding that they have this similar circumstances um, to you and just making sure that they're valued and that you're creating those those personal relationships. I, I can't stress that enough. I think that a lot of people, um, what we've heard in the past few years is the younger population really just likes that, that technology type of um, relationship, but that truly isn't the case. They want that engagement. Yeah. Thank you. Candice, I'll ask you the next question. So I know you've done a lot of research on, on these topics. So what are, would you mind sharing with us some of the stresses uh, that the M and face? And also, if you would also mind, I know you've done a lot of research, just adding some of the research that is currently being conducted around these. Sure. Uh, so I'd like to echo the sentiments of my previous panelists and say thank you for having me. And thank you to all the people that are out there listening. So airmen face um, various different stressors, both psychological and physiological. And uh, these stressors, um, as you all know, can impair your well-being, but it can also impair your performance. So at AFRL, we are really focused on keeping the airmen in that optimal state for performance. Um, one of the particular stressors that we are interested in researching is fatigue. And we use a model where we try to sense um, when the airman is experiencing fatigue um, objectively and before we see a performance decrement. Then we wanna assess their state of fatigue. And uh, then we wanna try to um, augment their performance by applying some type of intervention. Um, we have several lines of research that are uh, also interested in understanding the basis of stress and resiliency. Um, we're all different here in this panel and we all have different reactions to stress. We have different stress reactivity, a different stress of vulnerability and different stress resilience. So we're really interested in understanding uh, the molecular determinants for that and so that we can individualize our monitoring and that our interventions that we can apply for Amy. Oh, thank you. That's like really important research. Tara, over to you next. And I loved having you at our workshop here in Las Vegas. And I remember being in a session with you where we were discussing the pillars of well-being. And you were an incredibly passionate advocate for adding a financial well-being to the already established kind of official DOD list. I would love for you to share with our audience, you know, why you are so passionate about adding financial well-being to the pillars. Yeah, I'd love to. Well, thank you, Mark, again, as everyone has said, uh, for having us here. And thank you to all who are tuning in. Um, as you mentioned, I was extremely passionate about making sure that financial wellness is added as a pillar to the, uh, you know, the, the wellness and the well-being, um, you know, group that the airman has already been focusing on. And I think, you know, that's because money is so pervasive in all of our lives, right? It's a common thread, no matter what you are doing, uh, whether you're, you know, in the military or you're in the civilian life. And so I think that when it comes to, you know, money and how we think about these things, many airmen are, are in the military, uh, one, because they want to serve, but also because it 
provides a steady stream of income, especially with what we're seeing with, you know, unemployment rates being historically high right now, uh, you know, they have a safe, stable income, but that doesn't mean that they're not without financial stress. Maybe their spouse has lost their job. Maybe their spouse can't go to work anymore because they now have to homeschool their children uh, because those children can't go to school or whatever it might be that is happening. And I think that it's really important to recognize that financial wellness is such a huge stressor in our lives or, or money can be such a huge stressor in our lives. It's one of the biggest uh, pieces of stress when it comes to, um, you know, divorce or, or marital stress. It's the, one of the biggest pieces, you know, causes of arguments, I think, in a lot of relationships. And when you have your finances in order, those other pillars can then be built up and can strengthen the kind of house, right, that you have if you think of yourself as a, as, as a building. Uh, but if your finances are not in order, it can really cause cracks in those foundation uh, that then really kind of crumble those other pillars. If your money is not in the right place, you're not then able to go out and focus on, you know, your spiritual well-being or your physical well-being or your mental well-being because you're worried about just how you're going to feed your family today. Uh, so I, I personally think it's very important that we include financial wellness into this discussion because it's, it's in, you know, inevitable, you know, it's something we can't ignore. We cannot ignore the fact that this is such a huge part of our, our airmen's lives. Thank you. And you can tell you're still passionate. So passionate. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, I'd just love to come to you because I know for me, I, I obviously I've never served in the military. I've never worked for the government in my life. Um, so I know for me, I, I think of my own life and I know my friends' lives, but could you just mind sharing with the audience? Because I think the, probably the majority of the audience are not military. Um, just the biggest differences that, that normal life in the military would have over normal life in the civilian world. Sure. Um, well, I, I want to preface this by saying that the differences are unique, but they're not any more strenuous or more important. Um, everyone's stressors, everyone's life challenges are important to them. So I just wanna preface that by saying that. Um, it is just unique to the military. But uh, one of the things, I think the foundational difference is uh, service in the military is one of the occupations um, that really has the members signing their unlimited liability clause. And that means that whenever called upon, they will answer the call regardless of the situation. And I think that in and of itself puts um, a different spin on their commitment level to, um, to, this, to the service, to the country. Um, but also uh, there's some pressure there, if I'm being honest, you know, just not knowing what's coming next. Um, but the, the things that people experience on a day-to-day -day basis are, um, one of the big ones is the PCS move, and that is the permanent change of station. So when we get assigned to a new duty location and taking, for example, a family, um, I know I'm married, I have two children. When we move, um, it's challenging for me. Yes, of course it is. Um, I have to readjust to a new location, new people, uh, all those things. However, I'm also taking into account, I'm welcomed into a team automatically. I have camaraderie building just from the, the very first meeting uh, with folks. And so there's a different dynamic there for me, but for families, they don't have that. They are gonna be showing up and they're going to not necessarily have that forced interaction with others to um, have friendships built and kids have left their schools and their sports and all of those things. So it's very challenging. Um, for the family unit to kind of get going again. For us, it took us about the six month average to kind of get into a good groove. Um, so that's, a, that's another challenge. But um, military life also comes with challenges with regard to um, spousal employment, um, because like I said, they are leaving jobs behind and to start over, um, my husband is a tennis instructor. And so when he has a client base, that changes every time we move. And so that's a challenge. Um, but then additionally, CDC care, which is not unique to the military. There is a national crisis for CDC care, uh, excuse me, um, child development care. Um, but for us, there is the, you know, we're not next to our families. We don't have the support um, that we could reach out to some people who have good uh, family networks. So we don't have that and we're mandated for the, the duty, right? For the, the showing up to work every day. So there's just some unique challenges that we face, um, albeit the Air Force has put in place a ton of resources and great um, agencies for us to, to give us help. Awesome. I just noticed in the live stream, um, someone just made the point for spaces when they, when they move, 
Is there a central place where they can go to look for employment options in that area? Or is that something that you're working on? Actually, I will defer to Maggie. Maggie, do you? Yes, I'm so glad that you asked. So we have a huge ecosystem of support uh, really tailored for spouses. So there's something called the Airmen and Family Readiness Center that is at each installation. And it's staffed with individuals that are there specifically to help um, airmen and their families, so their spouses, find employment, find homes, those types of things. But in addition, um, there's a lot of great things that are coming out of what we call our services realm that are focusing on making it easier for spouses to find employment um, by those big partnerships with big companies. Um, and so over the next few years, we'll see that grow as well. Cool. Tara, I can see you nodding. Anything you wanna add? Yeah, I will just add as a spouse myself, although it, I'm a Navy spouse, not an Air Force spouse, um, that one of the, the benefits that I've been able to take advantage of is the My SECO, so My Spouse Employment Career Opportunity, I think is what it stands for, and then also the My CAA Scholarship, so the Career Advancement Scholarship. Uh, that actually, while we were stationed in overseas in Japan, I was able to use that scholarship to take a certified financial planner course, and I was able to attain my certified financial planner designation while we were stationed overseas. Uh, and that was an enormous benefit for me when we got back to the States. Awesome. Thank you. I just got to one other question that came through on our live stream. I think maybe this is for Maggie, but uh, can this Mary Tara, feel free to jump in. Um, so rather than having processes in place to deal with stresses once they've happened, what preventative measures um, does the Air Force implement? So I'd like to start the conversation and you guys can jump in. So um, the Air Force, again, we've got this huge ecosystem that's in place. And so from the moment that an airman gets into the military, um, they start a process in developing resilience skills, coping skills, life skills, those types of things. And it happens um, right from day one. And that continues with them throughout what we call the continuum of learning. And it goes through them with something called technical training. That's where they learn the technical trade, um, whatever they're going to be doing in the Air Force. Um, and that continues when they get to their installation. Once they get to the installation, when I say that, what I mean is they get trained and then they get assigned to a installation to start their Air Force career doing the job that they've learned to do. Um, they, they participate in something called the first term airman course. And in that first term airman course, there's something called resilient skills training. It is founded by air, um, positive psychology, so it's evidenced with that. And really what it does is it equips the airman right away with some foundational skill sets that we know um, are used to combat everyday stressors. Um, and the goal with that is to get them to start adopting them early, to use them for everyday stressors that military members are going to face, in addition to the ones that Chief just mentioned, the PCSing. Transition is huge. I mean, that's a big life stressor for anybody. Um, so the idea is for them to adopt those, bring them into their everyday life so that it's like the go-to for the brain. So when something does happen that might be traumatic to them, um, they will have a go-to that their brain automatically goes to and it helps to better equip them to handle those um, heavier situations, if you will, better. So that's set in place. And then as they continue throughout their career, they have some very specific things placed. And I'm, I'm hoping Chief can jump in because you've been through most of those um, as we develop our airmen. I was actually going to add exactly that. So from the um, Maggie talked a lot about what can we do for ourselves and how are we giving them the skills to kind of cope internally. But additionally, the professional military education system starts them very young where we actually teach them leadership concepts and principles. And then through that, show them preventative ways to lead others, uh, preventative ways to help people through their own issues by leading. And so when we're doing that, we're teaching all of these skills. That is a preventative measure from the leadership perspective, as opposed to the internal. So we're trying to do it from multiple angles. Awesome. Candice, I'd love to throw this next question to you. So uh, we've, we've got a lot of submissions to this particular challenge and a number of them were around you know, using technology. I'd just love to hear from you because I know this is probably one of the areas of your field. What technologies do you think are relevant that, or could be relevant uh, to address uh, stress and resilience within our airmen and their families? Thank you for that question. Um, my current research, we do a lot of non-invasive brain stimulation. So these technologies have been used to um, improve mood, but also when um, an airman is stressed with a high workload 
or um, there could potentially be a performance decrement from sustained attention, you can use these uh, non-invasive stimulation technologies to increase their alertness. And I've been studying these different technologies, also why there are certain enhancements for some individuals versus others, and um, others at AFRL have uh, looked at it in more of an applied aspect and looking in military service members, the benefits that we can have from uh, non-invasive brain stimulation. Awesome, thank you. Um, Tara, could you share just for the audience, because I'm sure we, we not, not, not everyone here knows, what, inf what information do Airmen currently get in relation to financial planning support, if any? And then if you could also just add on to that, what do you think they, they should have access to? So what additional features do you think would have the biggest impact in, in helping our airmen and their families? Yeah, so I think the core of what is provided from a financial education or financial wellness standpoint is the personal financial readiness program, uh, which is designed to help airmen and family members provide the foundations uh, on the beginning of their career and then kind of continuing throughout. And uh, as far as I know, it requires 12 touch points of financial literacy kind of as they go through their career, um, they are required to do some training, some of which is optional, most of which is mandatory. And so while I think that the education and the training itself is a great place to start, it's a really good core. I think there has to be a lot of um, kind of layers of interaction and implementation that are, are kind of put on top of that. So uh, because we don't want people to just know what what to do or what they should be doing. We want them to actually change their habits for the better. So, you know, some of the things that should maybe be considered uh, when thinking about a financial wellness solution um, would be things like, you know, in-app um, like Q&A or some way to get their questions answered as to how it pertains to them. Um, maybe access to a financial advisor. I actually know a number of companies corporate financial wellness companies in the private space that have this kind of educational component. They've automated or provided technology to automate the financial planning process for an individual. And then they provide access to a financial planner to either walk that individual through their plan um, or for that person to then ask questions and get more information. And then the next layer would be some way for them to actually take action and put that plan to work, uh, whether that's, you know, in-app connections to different you know, partner companies uh, for banking, for credit cards, for loans, for investing, some way where it's like, hey, here's your plan. Here's what we recommend that you do to have a, a sound financial foundation. And then immediately, you know, a, a place for them to actually take action uh, would be to me the most kind of holistic solution that they could put in place. Awesome. Great advice. OK, my final question. I'm going to throw it to you, Maggie, but anyone please tag on. Um, so I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, well-being and resiliency within the Air Force. And some people just seem to only really talk about these giant kind of really stressful events that happen in, the, in people's lives. And that, that is then a trigger to actually get some help. Whereas I'm, I'm sure it's, there's probably a lot more to it than that. And there's, that's probably the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of, you know, everyday stresses that people have. So I'd love for you to talk about that if you would. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that's a great question. And I think that uh, there is a misnomer that people practice resilience only or, or get the help when something traumatic happens. But really, what we know is resilience can be learned. And over time, it builds in the brain as the go to as we talked about earlier. So not only can somebody self um, assist themselves in building those skills, but in addition, it's seeking that help as early as possible, just kind of like Tara said, getting with that financial person as soon as possible so that you can reduce those stresses like stressors later on. And so that's part of our strategy is to really start encouraging our airmen, um, their spouses as well, to not to reduce that stigma from going to seek help because we all endure stressors and we've all been through it um, there's a lot of things that are similar for many of us and if we had the conversation they would find that wow they had the same type of stressor i did when they were at uh, this rank or at this installation as a military spouse myself i can say uh, over 20 years a lot of stressors so that's really the conversation that we're trying to ignite so that they are seeking that help early and one of the ways that we're hoping to do with this challenge is to make getting that type of support or assistance or seeking that help so much easier. Uh, honestly, as easy as maybe even being able to talk into an Alexa, those types of things, because we need to simplify it for them so they can reach the resources as soon as possible. 
Um, but at the end of the day, it's getting it early and then building those go-tos so that when something does traumatic happen, you don't have a buildup of a bunch of other things going on at the same time, because that's something we want to avoid. Cool. I got 30 seconds left if anyone else would like to add on. But thank oh, you. go ahead. Oh, no, Mary, you please, you go. Sure, okay. Um, just adding on to uh, the, the understanding resilience from the perspective that it doesn't mean you're unbreakable. It means mm -hmm. that you have um, the tools in place to help you through that when something does get broken, because we're all going to go through the process. We're all going to have ups and downs. And so we just want to make sure people are equipped. We're all equipped with the understanding and the acknowledgement of when we need that, when we need that extra assistance. Tara, quickly. Yeah, I would just say when it comes to your financial well-being, it's really about those small daily habits that you're implementing, kind of like, you know, taking care of yourself physically so you don't have to go get intervent or intervention medicine. It's about the preventative stuff. So making sure you're saving for an emergency fund. So when this trauma does occur, maybe your spouse loses their job or, you know, something breaks in the house, you have the funds to, to put towards that. You're not stressed out about it. And then you're also, you've got that baseline of wellness so that when larger things come up, buying a house, uh, moving, having another child, you're then able to seek financial advice for those larger milestones but you're kind of taking care of your day-to-day -day by yourself. Got it. All right. Well, I just want to really thank you all. Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.